Well, since this is our last session, I want to make it short, and I promise to be short, although uh, people in our fellowship tell me that whenever I get behind one of these, it's never short. Uh, but it is getting later, and I am sensitive to the fact that we've been here a while, and um, I know after lunch, things begin to uh, get cloudy, and uh, blood rushes to the stomach and things like that, so I don't want to delay any more. Um, Jacob will be back up, so I just want to make sure we, um, for the sake of the camera and things like that, that uh, for the film. But I wanted to thank Blair, and I wanted to thank him so much because he's such a good brother. We just met uh, this this particular year in, in person, and uh, we've been talking since last year, and uh, the Lord has really brought people together, uh, not only for this conference, but for uh, Canada, the believers here, Memorial Canada, and uh, I just wanted to thank him so much because he's like an older brother. He's been such a good brother to me. And uh, Alan, which I just met, he's been helping uh, uh, coordinate this. So Alan, wherever you are, uh, muchas gracias. Uh, very much a lot of thanks to Alan. And, um, and so thank the Lord for you guys as well. So um, we wanted to show a few things. Uh, this is not the prophecy up there. You just had it. Uh, but just some of the things that we wanted to address as Christians. And we wanted to make it very, uh, uh, very candid. The last session, I call, I'm going to call it, Now What? I've been to a lot of conferences. I've been to a lot of meetings. And over the course as Christians, of course, you've probably been there just as much as uh, yourself. And people get really excited during the weekend. And you have Brother Jacob and you got other speakers. And people get excited and they go, man, I've learned so much. And we get to the highest of heavens and we're up in the stratosphere with teachings and good doctrine. And then we have to come down because we can't stay up here that long. Things have to end. Things have to move on. And, and in fact, uh, we have to live our faith. And our faith is never to be lived out in, in, in within four walls. It's never meant to be that. Our faith is to be lived out out there. You entering the mission field out there. It's safe here, but it is lived out out there um, primarily. I mean, you get to live it out here. And it's important to be in fellowship because that's where you get to live out your faith first so you can go out into the world and make disciples. If, it's, if you can talk about Christ here, you can talk about Christ out there. If you can't talk about Christ in here, it's very, very unlikely you'll be talking to, about Christ out there. This is why fellowship is so important. You build each other up. You can share about Christ here. It's safe. It's good. We can even correct each other. You can have some things that may not be uh, straightened out and then talking to other believers and go, oh, I understand it now. Uh, hearing Jacob, hearing other brothers, you can get good doctrine and then you can live it out out there. So this is the uh, one of the things that happens in conferences. You're up here in the heavens, then you got to come down and you got to walk. And so uh, part of today's last session is to say, now what? Because now we're up against things. Now you're going to be out tomorrow uh, we don't have a meeting tomorrow, per se. Uh, I think we're meeting with a few of the believers here, but we don't have a meeting for everyone. We don't have a, a Bible study service tomorrow. So it's really important to say, okay, now I've heard Jacob and us for two days. Now what do I do with all this information I just downloaded? And uh, maybe I'll watch the YouTube uh, videos again. But what do I do with what I have? And so I wanted to let you know, what we're up against first, because it's really important to know what we're up against, what we need to do, what foundations we need to build on, and then a little bit about what I believe the Lord has uh, has shared with me, has shared with Blair uh, and others about what to do going forward, because it's really important. In fact, it is much more important to what happens afterwards than what happened this week in here. It's important to really get a good hold of Believers that are here, if you're if you're here, uh, you should be in touch with someone. If you came this weekend, you should leave this weekend with someone's information. If it's Blair, if it's Moriel's, if it's uh, information about how to get a hold of other believers, uh, because that was really the heart of this meeting, uh, this conference this weekend. It's church for the churchless to put believers together with other believers, because it's not about the building. You don't have a building per se, although we're meeting in one, but we have. Temples of the Holy Spirit all over this place here. And as bricks, we come together, and therefore we can build each other up, and it's built up into a beautiful temple. And that's what the book of Peter tells us. We build each other up. We're temples. We're, we're stones in the temple. 
and the Lord is building his temple. And I remember a song now, so I'm not going to sing because I don't. Uh, but I wanted to show you just, this is from Toronto uh, Gay Festival. This was recorded this year, and it was Christians witnessing. And uh, I thought it was very appropriate to talk about this because this is what you and I are up against. I am from California. Um, we might as well say communist Russia, 1951. Uh, it feels that way. Um, although it's pretty, and that kind of gives you the, the, the illusion that everything's okay. Everything's not so much okay. Uh, but this is from Toronto. This is a, a festival where Christians went to witness, and they met an Anglican priest or an Anglican minister. Uh, and the issue was, of course, Romans chapter 1. It's a long video, but I'm only going to play about three minutes of it because this is what you and I up against as believers in the 21st century. As Jacob said, we could have been born in any other century. Been born again in any other century, but we're born again here. We're born in this era to face things like this. And uh, so I'm going to give you, it's about three minutes. So if you can hold your attention for three minutes, that would be, that would be good. Can anyone see it? I need to move out of the way. Okay. Maybe I'll move this out of the way a little bit here. I don't know her name and it's, it's not that important. It's just, this is the attitude in the mainstream denominations of so-called Christianity. Do you read Greek? Right. Do you read, do you read Koine Greek? Because do you, I actually do read Koine Greek. Okay, so what does it say in the Greek? You can read any No, this is important. Yeah. What does it say in Greek? Uh, which, which passage? Romans, Romans chapter Romans 1, chapter where one. it says that, uh, I would say the second half of the okay. chapter. Yeah, that, where, the second half of Romans what does it say chapter 1 is actually a very complicated point of interpretation because Paul appears to be speaking in quotation marks here and primarily speaking about um, Roman, Roman customs as opposed to Jewish customs. What he's addressing may be temple prostitution. Um, certainly some of what he's addressing is heterosexuals engaging in non-reproductive sex practices. He certainly had issues with that. Paul did not have the same understanding of sexual orientation or committed same-sex partnerships that we do. Um, on the other hand, most of the passages which are taken as a condemnation of homosexuality are based on disputable translations of words which are often hapax lugomena okay. and whose understanding we, we do not, we can't fully translate with accuracy. Can I ask you a question? Do you support uh the month of June's uh, celebration of gay pride. I do. I have seen in the lives of same-sex couples, which I know, um, the fruits of the spirit. I have seen loyalty. I have seen sacrificial love. I have seen Christian lives much better than my own. And I believe that as with Peter and the Gentiles, when I witness the fruits of the spirit in the lives of committed same-sex partners, many of whom are Christians, then I respect that as demonstrating an extension, an extension of how we have understood the gospel, as widening our understanding of what is included. Do you support uh, gay pride parades? Yes, I, I, that... I attend. Okay, I march so in the pride on, one parade. Second, yeah. One second. Yes. Uh, so what about when people come out here and they have uh, these parades, yeah. uh, do not witness the other unspeakable acts of debauchery, drunkenness, celebration of wickedness. There's all kinds. It's not just uh, even a celebration of gay you're pride. You're having anymore. much more fun at Pride than I am, I think. No, I'm not even going to Pride, but I've seen the videos of just uh, people dressed in very lewd Children. ways, and they're dressing their children up and celebrating this lewdness and, a small number and of sexual people, immorality. A small number of right? people are lightly dressed. I am not particularly particularly concerned about that. It's a particular context. The majority of people at the Pride Parade are just wearing ordinary Do you believe our bodies clothes. are temples of the Holy Spirit and then we're supposed to keep our bodies holy as God is holy? Uh, yes, I think I have a different interpretation of what, what it means to keep your body holy. Keeping our body holy. Will you share I, that with us? Acting with love, with integrity, with service to the poor, Sounds with loyalty, with... Okay. All of these things. Okay, but what about the sin that we commit with our bodies against God? I think the worst sin we commit with our bodies against God right now is our indulgence of our appetite for fossil fuels, which is destroying the planet. I think that's that good, that's putting, your, really putting your body in a car and going, I'm going to drive my car, is a way that's worse a really sin good. than you, any you, sexual what is practice. It what is it saying in Romans chapter 1? 
And you know, I'm just saying, I'm sorry to interrupt. She uses the term atextual Gemini. That means the word that occurs only one time in Scripture, the Jews in Greek. Because there's only one time in the New Testament in, in Koine Greek, that doesn't mean it's not in the Septuagint. It does not mean it's not in the classical literature. It does not mean that it's not in the patristic literature. So I'm just giving a poor argument. J Joshua, should we get this on? assuming other people don't know Greek as well as she It knows. may not matter. Okay. I didn't play it to get Jacob riled up, but I thought it, it I thought it would. Um, yes, it, 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 it is. Um, it, we, him and I had talked about this before, about uh, the argument about Romans 1, obscure words in translations. That's what she used. Oh, you can't trust your translation because nobody really knows what these words are. It, you know, Paul had an issue. He was a misogynist. He had issues with... Uh, non-reproductive uh, non sexuality, you know, Paul's just, just kind of weird, and he used these sort of quotations, and he might have been quoting someone else, and, and, and it it's really clouds the argument. But when you really peel back, and we just did a study in Romans 1 not too long ago, you can find it on our, our YouTube page, uh, we really break down the, the words that are in Romans chapter 1, uh, you can come to the realization that these words were used by uh, there were some of the words were in classical Greek, some of the commentaries from the church fathers. You can know exactly what these words mean. So they're not obscure words. They're, and it's in the Septuagint also. So these are not obscure words. It's translated correctly. If you have a good translation, it is exactly what it's supposed to be like in Romans 1, where it does condemn homosexuality as, as a, uh, as a practice. But it also condemns a lot of other sins. And I think sometimes we get caught up in that one thing, but this is in particular one dealing with its political, its, its being weaponized against the church. And this is what we're up against. And this is what we're talking about. Now what? Because we have to deal with this issue. Many Christians, but they feel like this. What, what can I do? What do I do? I go to this denomination. And by the way, she's not alone as an Anglican. Uh, Methodist, Presbyterian, um, um, what's the other one? Methodist, Presbyterian, Lutheran. A lot of them, not every single one will have the same argument as her, but this is the common one. This is the most accepted belief and translation and interpretation of Romans chapter 1 within mainstream Christianity. It is the exception now to believe that Romans 1 says what it says. It is the exception and so what do we do as Christians? How do we combat this? Well, obviously, we need to know the truth. We need to get into God's word and understand it and get it from solid teachers to, if it's, if it's uh, difficult for us to understand some of these passages, to trust some of these uh, good commentaries that are out there if you need them. However, it says what it says. It means what it means, and you can trust the translations that you have. Um, you know, hopefully you have a good one. Uh, we could talk about that in Q&A, what we recommend and things like that. But nonetheless, now what do we do? You're up against a society. I live in California where this is completely shoved down your throat. The, um, there it is, the Equality Act. It's coming to the U.S. I'm not sure if Canada has something in the works coming with the new prime minister. It's already, I, some of it has already passed, yeah. Uh, and I don't know if they're going to ratchet up more. But in the states, the Equality Act is coming. California just passed one that has to do with pastors and counselors and leaders that you can no longer uh, share or talk to people that are in the homosexual lifestyle. You can't share with them. You can't talk them out of it. You can, you know, they call it conversion therapy. Unfortunately, they've used that term to uh, to describe all kinds of things. Is that we're against conversion therapy? Really, what they mean is we're against anybody sharing anything with homosexuals that will divert them for what they believe it's it, that they are transgender or they believe they're homosexuals. And so they have made this a law that pastors have to agree to this. Now it's an interesting law because it's there's no repercussion to this law yet. It simply states it's a foundational law which cities and counties and other um, I guess you could say cities, counties, um, states can actually adopt and say we can build on this law and actually penalize pastors, counselors, and teachers. So we're, uh, myself being in California, we're up against this. Uh, by the way, there are pastors who supported this, uh, the, uh, the, the California one, 
who said, no, 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 the, the homosexual community just simply wants to have a conversation because uh, pastors are known to be haters toward the homosexual group, and so they don't want them to be hateful anymore, so therefore they just want to have a peaceful dialogue. And um, remember, I wasn't born yesterday, and I wasn't born in that country. I, I know exactly what governments do and uh, how they get away with things. They parse words, they pass laws, and they begin to encroach little by little in some of the things that um, Christians are able to compromise in this. And I remember talking to friends. We have friends in our fellowship, believers in our fellowship, who were at the time of Roe versus Wade. They were very young men and women. And they tell me the story how Roe versus Wade happened. It was introduced as abortion uh, constitutional. You know, they, 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 they say it's a constitutional rights now. Uh, but it was basically the uh, Supreme Court justice passed it, Roe versus Wade, on the basis in the church compromise because they told them, no, it's only going to be for exceptions. It, it, the abortion is only going to be for exceptions. It's never going to be the law. It's just, oh, you know, we just we just need to kind of relax on it. And then the church said, sure, why not? And then it went to the first trimester, the second trimester. Now you could see the monster that it is. It is absolutely out of control. It is now infanticide. And it's now the governor of Virginia saying, well, you know, the baby's born, and, and then we'll decide what to do with it. Well, who's going to decide what? To, oh, the doctor and the mom, and it's going to be, we're going to have a, a conversation about what to do with the baby. Well, the baby's born. <laughs> But what are you talking about, how, what to do with the baby after it's born? And, you know, he has such a southern accent. He's such a, some, such a calm southern accent. He just sounded so good, and he's kind of lulled you to sleep. He's such a nice, you know, he's a doctor, by the way. He's a doctor and a governor of Virginia. And, uh, but not only him, but Cuomo and, and New York and, and California as well. Many share the same sentiment. It's gone over the top. And the Equality Act will bring that about just as well. Forget the fact that hormone therapy, as John was talking about, it's lethal. They don't even know what it is. They can't even tell you what it's going to do to children. In fact, uh, um, one of the hospitals, uh, Hopkins, uh, John Hopkins Hospital, one of the leading psychiatrists there said, you know what, we're playing with fire. We don't even know what these side effects are going to be on kids. We've never tested them for a long period of time. We're giving them and just, you know, putting them in kids, and we don't know what's going to happen to them. We need to stop. And, of course, I don't think he's going to have a job pretty soon because he's trying to put the brakes on this, a lone voice. But nonetheless, it's known now that these hormone therapies, they don't know the side effects, and it's actually very lethal. Of course, that is suppressed. Nobody wants to talk about it. And, uh, of course, this is really prevalent. Uh, this is, uh, uh, this is, of course, put on by, uh, Whole Foods in the city of uh, Atlanta. It's sponsored by football teams and, uh, basketball teams in the Atlanta area, which is, uh, of course, the, the mayor supported this. And it's drag queen story. Basically, drag queens go into children's libraries and they read at, uh, reading time. By the way, uh, I wish I would have brought the other picture. This happens in churches. Churches are actually hosting this. We actually, uh, some of our believers, some of our brothers and sisters in our church call the, some of the churches where they live nearby and says, what are you doing? Because they advertise Drag Queen Children's Story, Orange County, California, at a church. And, um, of course, they didn't care, but this is sponsored. This is going on, and this is a society which we live in. The Bible says Lot was vexed by the things he saw in Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't know what he would feel like that today. Uh, climate change. You heard the, the so-called minister from the Anglican Church talking about, you know what the greatest sin is going to be, or what it is now? It's your fault. You are killing the planet. Consumption of fossil fuel. It is a cult. Climate change is a cult beyond the cult now. And you have uh, Congresswomen, the four horsewomen of the apocalypse in our in our nation. They call it the squad, the squad, but it's actually I would call them the four women of the apocalypse. AOC, the other lady, I forget her name, Clive and uh, Omar the Terrible. Anyway, these are absolutely going to trying to destroy. And they say in 12 years we're going to 12 years we're going to have an apocalypse. We're going to lose this. This world's going to end. I don't know if she knows Bible prophecy. Maybe she watches John Holler's uh, prophecy update, things like that. But she said, 12 years and we're done. 
Uh, by the way, she wants to eliminate, you know, travel and eating your burger and eating steak and, and basically charge you and, and tax you for eating meat. And, uh, it, it, you know, they call it an ecology crime. Uh, you're gonna, you're committing ecology crime. You're coming against the environment. And it is a cult, and of course, this is, uh, the, 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 they had it at the UN with the whole, the whole Greta thing, that girl that was giving the, the stink eye, and then they made her into a hero, and of course, she was just reading off a, uh, of a sheet that they gave her, you know, she, she doesn't even know what, she says carbon is the problem. Carbon? I studied a little medicine when I was, uh, in university. So did Jacob. The building blocks of life. Carbon. She's saying it's carbon. Carbon. You can't have carbon? That's terrible. I say, what are you breathing out? And what the plant uses for photosynthesis? Carbon. And they want to get rid of it. They didn't even know what they're talking about scientifically. They, they, they've gone beyond the point of reason. But this is at a seminary in New York. This is, of course, a, a great seminary. It's produced luminaries like uh, Bostick and uh, Colonel West. This is a Union Seminary in New York. They had, they had a whole session of repentance to plants of what they'd done to the environment. Union Theological Seminary defends confessing sins to plants. So this young lady was, uh, was put on display there to confess her sins of what she's done to the planet by driving a car, by eating a steak, by not being concerned about the environment, uh, not recycling. And so students, one by one, uh, this was on Tuesday. This is a couple of weeks ago. And so they asked this question. I think I have it on the, yeah. Uh, beautiful ritual. This is at their Twitter page and things that they put up. And, uh, extra activism, ritual, uh, ritual, liturgical responses, worship. And they asked the question on one, another Twitter that they had. What do you confess to plants? Have you confessed to your plants today? You know, it used to, it used to be that have you had your V8 today or something like that? You actually drank something that came out of plants. Now you have to confess them. And, uh, like I said, Harry, Harry Fostick and Colonel Wes came out of the seminary. It's not, it's a low expectation, but this is what seminaries are coming out. Green Christianity and all these things. They're going to really make it like Romans chapter one. They worship the creature rather than the creator who's blessed forever. Amen. You're watching it and this is what we're up against. This is your children, my children, your grandchildren. Um, we homeschool our kids. Uh, I have five kids. We homeschool them. Uh, my wife does most of the work. Praise the Lord for her. Uh, but it's a challenging thing because I'm like a, I don't know, I'm like a Martian, um, in my own state because they, they can't imagine what you have five kids. First of all, that's, that's kind of weird. Second of all, you homeschool them? What are you, a, 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 an abusive parent? And, uh, of course, that's the, that's the, that's the, 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 the stigma that we carry. But this is, I decided, you know, long ago that we were going to homeschool our kids because I didn't, I, I know what they teach. I know what, I was in those stuff. I, I believed that stuff. I was, uh, evolutionist. I knew what the science, and now it's worse. Now, it, at least it was scientific to a certain degree. Now it's fairy tales. Now it's just completely made up. And climate change is part of that as well. And of course, the Pope, May 14th, 2020, mark it on your calendar. He wants humanity to sign a document that says we're going to be one. We're going to have a new cur a currency system, a global economy. I, I don't know why he picked May 14th, 2020, but um, you can kind of guess that. May 14th happens to be the, uh, the in the, uh, Israel's independence and the creation of Israel. So, that is an interesting date, but nonetheless, he is head over heels over this. Going to the UN, going to churches, going to denominations, Christian denominations, evangelicalism, going back to Rome, coming home, and you've heard it all about it. I don't need to go through it again, but it is one of the most dangerous things that it's happening in our, in, in, in our churches is this, um, this love affair with Rome. This love affair with Rome. I, my family came out of Catholicism. My wife's family came out of Catholicism. According to Catholic doctrine, my wife and I are anathema because we were once Catholics and now we're not. And that is a sin. That is an anathema. That means that I'm going to hell. My kids are going to hell according to their doctrine, which is, which is most Catholics don't know that, but that's what it, that's what they say. At the same time, we know what Catholicism is. I've been to Mexico. I lived in a foreign country. Catholicism, it is not Christianity. 
It is not Christianity by far. But it's the greatest deception because it looks so much like it. And so the question I always have for pastors is, is Catholicism, is Catholicism uh, a true religion, true faith with false teachings in it? Or is Catholicism a false religious system with some true teachings in it? And based on your response, we'll tell you a lot about it. You know what most pastors tell me? It is a true religion. It just has some bad things on it. It just has some false things on it. Unfortunately, my pastor friend, you're wrong. And I asked him, I said, have you been a Catholic? No. I said, well, that's part of the problem. I mean, not that I wanted you to be one, but at the same time, you don't understand you don't understand the teachings, the culture, the background. And it's about Catholicism because we love Catholics. We want Catholics to know the Lord. We, we Five questions for Catholics that Jacob has on his website. Very good resource. Things that you can reach out to, Catholic family, Catholic friends, uh, preparing Catholics for eternity, another good book that uh, it's really good for somebody to reach people in the Catholic faith. But we want them to know the Lord. We want them to know the truth. Hey, I know, I'm glad somebody told me the truth. I'm glad my wife, she's glad somebody told her the truth. But this is what we're up against. And uh, I think they soft pedal this to the degree that it's compromising again. And compromising with Rome only leads one way, back to Rome. So we finish. Book of Acts chapter 2, if you could turn there very quickly. I just want to leave you with some practical things that you can walk with that you can grab a hold of and you can just take it with you and go, okay, what do we do? What do we do now? I know all this stuff and maybe I'm smarter for it, but that's that's good. That's the, that's the beginning. But what do we do with it? Turn to uh, chapter 2, verse 42. I'll read this very quickly there. The foundation is important. If you build something, it needs to have a good foundation. If it's a good foundation, you can build all the way up. If it's a bad foundation, it won't stand. And they were continually, this is after Peter's preaching, the salvation of uh, 3,000 Jews came to know the Lord that day. They came to faith and repentance and baptism. And now what do they do? Well, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everybody kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And although, and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common, and they began selling their property and possessions, and were sharing with them all as anyone may have need. And day by day they continued in one mind, breaking of, in the temple, breaking of bread from house to house, and they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number, day by day, to those who are being saved. If you study the book of Acts, it's a transition there. It's almost like Luke adds all these little comments at the end. The Lord began to add, and they're all over the first 10 chapters of the book of Acts. The Lord began to add. The Lord began to add. The disciples were being strengthened. The Lord begins to add. God did something amazing that day, and God did it, and the people responded. And this is the way the book of Acts is set up. God does something amazing and then you have to respond jesus ascends and he tells them go to jerusalem tarry until the holy spirit comes upon you that's something you got to do then the holy spirit comes and then peter preaches and then god does something they get saved and then now they're in fellowship and then in acts 3 and acts 4 another miracle then peter preaches and then people become saved and then they're persecuted, and, and God delivers them, and then they go back to prayer, and then it shakes the room up, and then they go back to preaching. And this is biblical Christianity, my friend. God initiates something so powerful, so amazing, only he can do. But then we are responsible to respond. And that is faith and trust in Jesus. It's always a response. God calls. Whom God calls, the book of Acts But then it also says, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's always a, there's always a two-way street here. He calls, you call on the Lord. He gives you the grace and the mercy to be saved. And then we respond by faith and obedience and loving Him, right? So there's always a response. So, you know, God loves us, but then we have to respond to love, right? He loves us, 
we love him back. He first loved us, therefore we can love him. Right? He saved us, so we continually trust him and believe in him and stay within the love of God. And that is what the Bible calls a relationship. He does something, we do something. He moves, we move. As you see God working within your life and within this group, then we ought to move. If God is stirring up something in your heart, then you will be obedient to it and move. They did it, and they did it in, two, in, in, in a couple of different ways. First of all, the book of Acts has three types of preaching in, in the book. There are three types of preaching. One is called the preaching to the lost. It's the preaching of the gospel to the lost. I got five minutes. You didn't do that to John. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, three types of preaching. I'll sum it up very quickly. Preaching to the lost. The second one is what you find here. Teaching of the apostles. The doctrine. The doctrine of the apostles. What Jesus taught and how the apostles taught it to the people. That's the doctrine. Our doctrine is apostolic. It comes from the apostles who learned it from Jesus and gave it to the church. And it's in the epistles, it's in the New Testament, it's in the letters. They got it from Jesus. That's the teaching of the apostles, the doctrine. And of course, there's also homilies, encouragement, encouragement to the body. And those three things are found in the book of Acts for the very purpose of the edification of the church. We need to preach the gospel to the lost. That's what Peter did in this chapter. We need to be in the apostles' doctrine, continually devoted to it. That means that we're continually be in the right teaching, right doctrine, learn what Jesus taught and how it's applied to you in the New Testament. But there's also time for encouragement, meaning that we are to go to one another and encourage one another to stay in the word or in fellowship or to believe and to continually uh, continue to do the things that God has called us to do. That's a homily. That's encouragement. So those three things are very important in any fellowship. If it's two, if it's three people, if it's four people, if it's 400 or a room like us today, keep walking with Jesus. Don't give up. No matter the adversity, no matter how you feel on Monday. Remember Monday's bad, right? <laughs> people are going to start believing it too, but, but it's true. Tuesdays are bad too, by the way. Uh, but at the same time, we need to understand that that is the three preachings that are found in the book of Acts. Uh, doctrine, fellowship, it's what this says here. They continue in doctrine, they continue in fellowship. That is the kononia, that is the iron sharpens iron. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Jacob already told you a lot about it. I'm just going to highlight these things. I guess consider this more of a highlight session at the end. Highlight the things that God has pointed out to us today. Uh, sharing things in common. There's going to be friction at times with believers. I know that almost impossible to believe that there would be friction among believers, right? But what do you do and how do you deal with it? It's the most important thing because it's going to happen. It's going to happen. There's going to be friction. There's going to be, but that's part of fellowship, isn't it? Getting rid of your old nature, being more patient and more kind and putting up and having forbearance for one another. That's a word that we don't use like as soon as somebody offends us, we're out of here. That's it. I'm out. I'm not coming back. But forbearance is to put up with someone's weakness. It's to deal. And I know you don't have any, but I do. And so you have to put up with mine and I have to put up with yours if you have any, right? Putting up with each other's weaknesses and still love each other and still go beyond the superficial aspect of Christianity that you see a lot today and get down to real fellowship Real love, real kindness to one another and encouragement, which we need that. It can't be all doctrine all the time. Well, it's important to have it. But there's times to encourage each other to stay in good doctrine. There are times to preach the gospel. A lot of times groups get stuck with only doctrine. They just study, study, study. And there's not encouragement to the body. And there's never an encouragement to go out and minister or share the gospel with the lost. And I don't mean to go and stand in a corner and, 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 and do it. If God calls you to do that, great. Praise the Lord. Sometimes it's as simple as sharing your testimony with somebody, passing a track. I see Blair inching, crouching over here a little bit, so I'm going to be done real quick. For, uh, um, the breaking of bread. Did I miss one? No. The breaking of bread. The Lord's Supper. Oh, we can have that today. That would be wonderful. If we had planned it out and thought about it, that would be wonderful to have today. 
uh, taking the Lord's Supper together, taking the Lord's table together. Fantastic. But there's something that Jacob talked about earlier. This is what keeps us in repentance, keeps us close to each other, because we don't want to drink it in an unworthy manner. We want to stay clean and pure with the Lord. And part of that is staying clean and pure with one another. If there's issues, let's talk about it. Let's pray about it. And forgive me, forgive you, and let's have the Lord's table together. And finally, prayer. A husband and wife that prays together stays together. A family that prays together stays together. A church that prays together stays together. Never undervalue prayer. I know it's so easy to, to do because it seems like prayer does nothing. Sometimes we go in prayer and say, what was that for? I didn't, not, I didn't feel anything. I didn't do anything. You waited on God and you were bringing your soul, you're bearing your soul to the Lord. And that is the beginning of that relationship with God. When we talk to God, we talk to him in prayer and we read his word, he talks to us back. And this is part of the relationship with the Lord. And so the mission of the church, very, very important. Uh, fellowship. Uh, this is something we did uh, this past uh, couple months ago uh, with some of the guys in our fellowship. And uh, uh, one of the guys from Morel, he came with us and we went and planted a church in Mexico. And it was such a wonderful, beautiful thing down in Topeak, Mexico. And it was, this is exactly what the church ought to be. Uh, we went there. We, they had the two missionaries that had gone from our church to that place. And they had preached the gospel for four years. They've had very few converts, maybe four or five believers. And they called us up and said, God's moving. Can you come? And uh, one of our elders says, you know what? The Lord's telling you, is telling us that you need to go. And you need to take some of our guys with them to, um, with you to go to Mexico. So we prayed. We sought the Lord. We went there. We began to preach. We were there four days. Uh, about seven believers, seven people were added to the Lord, brand new believers. And this is one of them. And we baptized seven of them. So seven came their lives, gave their lives to the Lord. Seven were baptized. It was like the book of Acts to a certain degree. I'm not worthy of it, but it was just, it was an amazing thing. As we were preaching, people who started to become saved, they believed the gospel and they left. They were leaving Catholicism. They were leaving other churches and uh, false churches. There's a big cult in that, in that area. It's called the light of the world. It's a whole other story. It sounds really nice, but it's not. It's a cult based on two guys. One of them thinks he's Jesus. And, uh, but he's up in California in jail for pedophilia. So there's your Jesus, a, a light of the world church. In Mexico, La Luz del Mundo, that's what, the, that's what they're called. And, um, it was amazing. It was just a wonderful time. And the Lord added to that fellowship every day. Now there's a pastor there and he's pastoring a little group of about 15 people. And you see the group there. I, I was teaching there for about three or four nights. Uh, I think, I think we took a day off, but we, we just sought out to preach and God formed a little fellowship with it, with the, with the, uh, uh, a shepherd there now for them. So things to watch out for as, a, uh, as, as believers, because there are, as a pastor, I have to do this. You realize that, uh, pastoring means that feed you good things and also tell you to stay away from things that are not good for you. And we can talk more about that in the Q and A, but there are things that we ought to watch out for. And I think one of the major things, there's lots of them, but major things, highlights in my mind as I was going through it, uh, new apostolic reformation that's invading every part of the church. NAR, big, huge, from Bethel to Hillsong to everything has become NAR to a large degree. The music, uh, fellowships, churches, teachings, new apostolic reformation, this hyper-charismania type thing. Uh, be careful about hyper-Calvinism. This idea uh, that God sends people to hell, this idea that God created people for hell, this idea that the, the people don't, you know, it's, it's all, it's, it's all the sovereignty of God. Nobody can be saved unless, yeah, I believe nobody can be saved unless God wants to save them. That's true. But then you need to respond to the gospel as well. Repent and believe. That's what God does in us. And we have to respond in faith and, and repentance and faith. But this idea of hyper Calvinism that many ways morphs us into other things. Social justice movement, huge. And it's becoming part of these other movements as well. Uh, the social justice movement has to do with, it's not the gospel and being saved and going to be with the Lord. The critical part of the gospel is redeeming society. We need to stop slavery. We need to stop this. We need to stop that. We need to start, uh, stop, um, um, you know, slave trades and things like that. And, and those are all great things to think about as part of 
yeah, these are injustices in the world. And the gospel is there to take that away and redeem society. But it's not the point of the gospel. The gospel is to save us from sin. Jesus came to save us from sin. But they made it into a gospel, social justice. And of course, uh, there's always the dangerous with the Hebrew roots movement coming into churches. Huge, putting Gentiles under the law. The, uh, in our area, there's sojourners, commonwealth theology, that it's emerging very quickly. This idea that Jews and Gentiles, uh, I'm sorry, that Gentiles are lost, the lost tribes of Israel and needed to go back under the law. This is absolutely Hebrew roots. This is the old two house theory. This is the old two stick theory a while ago. It is emerging. It is seeping into churches, seeping into pulpits. And as Christians and as a pastor, I would need to tell you, to stay away from those things. Watch out for those things. As Paul would say, abide in Christ. And this is the commandment that we believe. They didn't get through. This is the commandment that we believe in the Son of God and that we love one another. Abide in Christ, my friend. Abide in Christ. As John says, little children, keep away from idols. Father, we thank you for today. We praise you and honor you because you are worthy. You're the only one worthy in this room and in this whole universe to be praised and honored. So, Lord, we thank you for your goodness and kindness that you visited us through your word and by your spirit. We ask you to help us to put these things in action in our lives. We ask you for Jacob. We thank you for him. We ask you for John, and we thank you for him. And we ask you, Lord God, that you would keep these men and you would, uh, Lord, protect them and watch over them as the enemy prowls like a roaring lion, seeking whom it may devour. I do pray for the fellowship here and ask you for your protection. But Lord, we ask in you, Lord, to organize great things and that you would res- uh, that we would respond in faith and obedience to your calling. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys.